Hi, everyone. It's Ari Honeyford with the Awkwardly Zen podcast, and we have a little bit of a crossover episode today. I'm so excited. Uh, this is the amazing Lori Hewitt, who many of you know and love, um, and you will grow to know Tom and love him as well. Uh, and these two folks, as you can tell from their gorgeous backgrounds, um, I, I put you guys above me to like have the space come together. Uh, you can tell that they work together or they're just really tuned in to one another, and they are working together on their own podcast. Uh, it is called Our Spiritual Sojourn. Uh, and I think first of all, I would love to hear from each of you of kind of uh, who you are, what modalities, what got you into spirituality, just a, a little you in a nutshell. So Lori, why don't you go first? Oh, okay. Um, well, my spiritual journey started I'm really old. So back in the 70s, <laughs> when I was introduced by my door opener, as I always called her, um, to Seth and Jane Roberts, all the things that she wrote. And it has just progressed since then, um, through the 80s. And, you know, I was not channeling at the time and didn't think I could. And then I started reading other books and realized, oh, channeling isn't just the way Jane Roberts did it, which was really leaving her body and letting something else step in and take over. Um, and so I've worked on that off and on probably the last 40 years, the last 35. I think I finally have found my groove and am mostly a conscious channel and channels spirit guides, angels, your soul council, interstellars, basically whoever shows up, the random family member that might drop by. So once I'm open, it, anybody can come through. I only use um, oracle cards for myself. I was never much into using cards or any other kinds of tools when I'm channeling, except holding crystals. And that seems to help channel my energy, I think, as much as spirit's energy coming through. All right. Well, there's so much there to dig into, but I want to come over to you, Tom, and uh, and ask you the same question. Well, I'm a little late to the party. Um, as, a, as a kid, I think I knew I had some ideas about spirituality and I did some hard time in Catholic school. Um, and I knew that some of the stuff that, that they were using as fear motivators were not real. You know, I knew there that a God that loved me so much more than I, more than I loved myself would not send me to hell. Mm -hmm. So I, I did question things from an early age. And so I've always kind of been open to there's something bigger and better and greater out there. And even as a kid, I had some synchronicities. I didn't have the kinds of things that maybe the two of you got at an early age, you know, in terms of visions and messages. But as I got into my 40s, I started getting more of that. And uh, there would be instances where I, I would just get clarity and it, it would last for a little while and that would go away. So I've tried to, to harness that. The other side of me is I do a, a whole lot of, I, I was an IT professional. And in our career, we would go into companies and learn their systems very quickly. And so we learned to uh, ask all the good questions and uh, pick up information and see how everything fit together. And that's really one of the things I bring to this partnership with Lori, because she is extremely clear and all I have to do is ask the questions and I get the answers. And how lucky is that for me? So we work well together and um, I, I try to extract as much as I can without draining her last ounce of energy. And, and we get a lot of good stuff out. Usually at the end of a, one of our episodes, we both look at each other and say, wow, that was great. And so this is really good for just for my growth. And I'm glad that it helps other people. Yeah, you know, I have to say, I think your podcast, what was the name of the podcast? Or it's still going on, yeah? It is, Our Spiritual Sojourn. Oh, no, what was the podcast I was on with you very early on? Oh, that was called Medicine Words. Okay, so that one's no longer active. It's alive. I don't participate in it. And once in a while, I think they put out an episode. Okay, so... I, that's how I met you was, yes. was, uh, years and years ago. I think you were actually maybe one of the first podcasts I was on after starting awkwardly Zen. Uh, and you are very good at asking questions. So I'm so grateful that you and Lori have, have teamed up to do our spiritual, spiritual sojourn, because I feel like, um, one, it's always so challenging when we feel like we have 
uh, I don't, I don't want to call it a weakness, but maybe something that we're not great at. And I know my friend Lori uh, definitely does not love the tech side of everything. And so to find someone who fits so well with that has been a blessing for sure. I, I've heard Lori say that many, many times. Uh, and as far as what you said there, Tom, with um, the same thing as me and Lori, I actually think I'm closer to you in in my path. It wasn't until I was 40 that I really embraced uh, and opened up to many of these things. And so, and I think there's so many people like that uh, right now who are being called into their own spiritual journeys, right? Their, their own spiritual sojourn, if you will. Uh, so Lori, coming back over to you, uh, let's talk a little bit about how you got involved with Awkwardly Zen, um, because it's one of my favorite stories. And and many of, of our listeners know, I give you a lot of credit for Awkwardly Zen actually existing, because it was in a session with you where you said, you need to start a meetup. And I went, what? Why? Uh, and that day we started Awkwardly Zen. And here we are, almost 20,000 people uh, later, four years later is, is pretty astounding. So um, talk to me a little bit about how the experience of uh, coming into Awkwardly Zen has been for you. Well, it was so funny. So I had just retired from my job and was probably doing my second psychic fair that I'd ever done in my entire life. And it was the Sacred Way Fair. It was, in a, it was in February, just before the lockdown, I think. Anyway, first woman, 10 o'clock strolls, you know, 10 o'clock comes, doors open. This woman named Ari comes and plops herself down in front of me and says, I want a reading. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so I start getting all this information, talks about writing a book. And I'm I'm hearing from these your guides saying, well, she can write a book, but that's not what really what she's going to be doing. Right. I tell her this. She wasn't all that happy with it, but she rolled with it. <laughs> and so we kind of finished up our reading. And then, then she had a bunch of friends with her that day. And they all kind of one by one came by and I had a reading. And at the end of the day, I was thinking, I don't know who these people are, but I want to be belong to their group. And then a few months later, um, she contacts me for a reading. We get together. They start giving her information again. And then she starts talking about this vision that she has. And what came through was, well, you need to start a meetup. They're on Zoom now. And that was the beginning of Awkwardly Zen. Mm -hmm. I am not a joiner. I, I think the only other meetup I ever attended was Kendara's, who's also part of Awkwardly Zen, who I've known for years. And hers were always in person until the lockdown happened. And I was like, I don't know if I wanted, wanted to go to these things or not. But I had said I wanted to be part of that group. So my guide was like, you need to go to this meeting. So I jumped on and the rest is history, as they say. It's like, it was amazing. It was amazing that very first meeting, how many people were actually there. Mm -hmm. And starting out when I did, my journey has been mostly alone or with one or two trusted friends, confidants that I could chat with. Because when I started, I was kind of in the Bible Belt, Southern Indiana, Western Kentucky-ish. And we would laugh and say, we need to be quiet because we could get burned at the stake as a witch back then. So we were very quiet. And it was such a gift to find this tribe of people that I had been waiting for and looking for my entire life. And here you all are. And it was such a wonderful experience and still is to know that I have this huge group of people that I've met that I would have never met unless it was for Awkwardly Zen. Yeah. You know, when, when people ask me how I feel about divine timing, uh, I, I cannot deny what has happened because before I sat with you, uh, just a, f a week before I had been, I was traveling back and forth to Kansas for work from Colorado. Mm -hmm. And so I listened to a lot of podcasts. Uh, and a lot of audiobooks. And I had listened um, to this podcast that was about soul councils. And all I could think was, oh man, I have got to find someone who does these soul council readings. And then that fair came up and it said, this woman does it. And, and, you know, it's hard to tell here and with the background, but Lori has the most amazing eyes. And so when I walked in 
to uh, walked into the fair and you're right. It was right before COVID. It was, we were all still public. There was no question where I was going first and bless Lori for not flinching when my big energy came right at her and was like, okay, tell me everything. Um, But I just knew, like, I knew I had to, I had to meet with someone who could meet with my soul council. Uh, And so it was such a blessing right right away. And and what is the joy? And that was before Awkwardly Zen even existed. But that joy of knowing in community that then my experience got to go to the next person and the next person and the next person. And that's really what it's all about to me is how can we get people in front of who they need to hear from? And every single person who sat down with you that day was like, oh my gosh, that lady is amazing. <laughs> so now Tom, we talk about how amazing Lori is. And as we know, she is. Um, what has been the most surprising thing about jumping into this world for you when you are embracing this channeling, embracing these messages? I think the surprising thing is that Lori's contagious um, <laughs> and that she's taught me a lot and I've gotten a lot of clarity. And when I struggle with it, she'll tell me um, how to adjust. Mm. So um, I've learned a lot. And and as the veil is thinning and as uh, my skills are getting better, I have this coach right here that helps me uh, know how to get things through both directions. So I think that's been the most surprising thing. I didn't know I had that. I kind of knew I had that. I didn't know I had that. Somewhere in the middle lies the truth. That's yeah. part of the backward. And the allure what? for awkwardly zen is that we all have these little awkward things that we go, I'm not sure, maybe, yes, no. And, and then you hear the word awkward and you go, that's me. I can handle that. <laughs> I could, they, they, these are my people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when the name was given to me, um, I didn't know what the name was for yet. I did think it was for the book and there will be someday a book um, called Awkwardly Zen, I'm sure. Uh, but when it was handed to me, I, I said out loud, I was working at a museum space that I used to work at. And I said out loud, that can't be available because the idea that Awkwardly Zen wasn't taken was so shocking to me, but it was waiting, right? It was waiting for us to all find each other for this opportunity and for the timing to be right. And so I'm, I'm always uh, in awe of that. And also it's a good reminder for me that when it's supposed to happen, it will get handed to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, for sure. What were you going to say there, Lori? Oh, I was just saying, I, I just wanted Tom to say a little more about his skills and, and how he's opening up more because you were also getting visitations at night, seeing things, hearing things, random visitors that come through. Can you speak a little more about that? <laughs> Here's what I love about Lori. Lori was like, all right, Tom, let me call you out. Let me help you a bit more. I know. I know you're going to stand up here and you stand up straight and tell these people the truth. Uh, Downplay, but here's the thing. You downplay your abilities and I think you need to really, it would be nice to see you step into them. I'm working, I'm working on that. Go ahead. I'm telling you what to do. She goes too much further. Um, I have definitely watched Lori Hewitt downplay her abilities uh and fight Thank you. into them so let me let Thank me just you. even the playing field here all three of us have done that so okay that, Tom I would love to hear more about that thanks Ari I appreciate you balancing out the score <laughs> um my my main Claire is audio so and I'm a musician um so I get a lot of things auditorily and um occasionally visually and uh, occasionally also the knowing. But um, I see a lot of orbs and flashes and things. And every once in a while, um, I, I just hear words, kind of like, I know Lori gets that too, and I bet, Ari, I bet you get that as well. You're sitting there pondering something and you hear all of a sudden a big yes or a big no. And so uh, that helps us all when it's able to come through that clearly. And the other thing for me is, is I learned to watch the synchronicities. And so the simplest of things is you're thinking about something that only is in your head. You haven't told a soul. And the next day someone tells you about it or you see it online or something like that. And and that has been just um, exploding in my life for the last maybe 10 years or so. So that's part of it for me. Those are my inputs. And when I start to see the synchronicities, I know that I'm coming into a period of clarity yeah. And then I can really work with my skills at that point. 
Yeah, I love that, Tom. And I think um, this is where it does have so much benefit to have someone like Lori around, right? Because in those moments of doubt, you can say, do you think this is a synchronicity? And I can guarantee you, Lori goes, yeah, of course it is. Right. And I, and I think that that is so beneficial. Um, it's also one of the reasons why I feel like my own personal gifts, um, blew up as fast as they did was because I had surrounded myself with mentors, with people who were going through it on their own and who had been doing it for longer than I had. And, and I do think that that's why uh, it is so beneficial to get into a community if you are exploring your psychic gifts. Um, mm -hmm. Because like Lori said, like Lori, imagine if you would have had this when you first started channeling, if you yes. would have had awkwardly Zen, it, it's so encouraging to say something and people are like, that's so cool instead of that's so weird. Uh, and even though we might go, Ooh, that's weird, but that's like the coolest weird I've ever seen. Uh, and I love that. I definitely do. So I am applauding you for stepping into your gifts. Um, now you said Claire audience is your strongest gift. Uh, Lori, yours is Claire cognizance. Is that right? No, it's Claire audience as well. Claire audience as well. Interesting. Although the more I've worked on this, the more I've channeled, all of the clairs seem to have been opening up. And so now it comes in a variety of ways. I never know for sure. It, and it's interesting. My strongest gift is clear cognizance, which is clear knowing, but mm -hmm. they utilize all of the senses within that knowing. So I will see something, but I'm not really seeing it. I'm knowing it, or I will hear something. So when you said that, Tom, I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hear things. Um, but but the flashes of light and that kind of thing are a big one for me. And I'm with you, Lori. The lo longer I go down my path and the more I fall into faith, the easier it is for the messages to come in multiple different ways, for sure. So talk to me about the podcast and a little bit about how it got going and what people can expect when they're watching your podcast, watching, listening. <laughs> well, so Spirit... In one of my meditations, several of my meditations actually, kept telling me I needed to do a podcast where they would channel information, you know, that would be part of the podcast. And I kept resisting, of course, because I always do. And they're pretty patient and they just kept coming back to it and coming back to it. Finally, one day, Tom and I were at lunch, I think, and I randomly said something about spirit was wanting me to do this and I wasn't sure. And he graciously said, oh, I'll do it with you. And I was like, Thank you, because it also needed to be on YouTube, which I knew nothing about. Um, and he said he would help me with that because he knew about that. And I was like, OK, let's do it. And then we proceeded to slowly put it together and jump in. Is that that's kind of how it happened, right? Yeah, is that mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it is. Yeah. And I was open to it because um, I had been told for years that I had a book in me. And I think this is the outcome of that quote unquote book. It's it's pages and chapters that come out once a week instead of in written hardcore, hard uh, paper form. Yeah. It's right there once a week in a audio. So it just works out. I love and, that. Yeah. And and Lori and I were were having lunch and this came about and I didn't want to do it, but I knew that it was it was in my future because I knew how much work it was going to be. But, um, and I said, I'll do it. And then it's one of those things inside your head. You go, you did not just say that. And then here we go. But I've enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. I've learned a ton. Um, and I don't regret a minute of it. Yeah. I also want to say, this is one of the most amusing parts to me. Is I'm a project manager by trade. And I was in IT and project management. And we don't do anything without planning. We, we, we talk about everything and we do risk assessments and everything is planned to the mm. detail. And, and when I'm doing this, the harder I try to plan, the less planning occurs. Mm -hmm. So it, it cracks me up because I'll be thinking about it all week and sometimes I'll message Lori and I've learned to quit doing that because nothing comes through. She, yeah. They're not talking and she's not talking and I'm the only one talking, trying to get a plan in place. But when we log on and... Uh, suddenly she gets the inspiration and she'll hear, oh, today we're going to talk about this. And so I've learned to go with the flow. There's no planning. We don't need no stinking planning. <laughs> so, um, oh. and, and the other part of that is I, um, sometimes I don't know what I'm going to ask 
until a half a second before it comes out of my mouth. So um, a lot of times I'll store up a couple of questions, but I get the inspiration during the podcast, like someone's saying, all right, Lori, over here, you say this. All right, Tom, over here, you say this. And then it comes together. So there's a whole lot of that. Yeah. And, and, and you ask the great, the greatest questions, honestly. Thanks. Yeah. You know, I think that um, sometimes I feel like a little bit of a puppet for the universe. Like there's moments where something comes out of my mouth and I'm like, well, that wasn't me. Uh, and, and I have to just go, okay. And so it sounds to me like you guys are experienced some of that of well, right? Like, it's like, you can't plan because it's really not you who's, right. who's making things happen. Um, mm -hmm. It's the divine one or our guides or whoever. And I, I think that um, if anything right now on my personal journey, I am being asked to surrender. And it sounds like there's some of that going on with you too, Tom. Yeah, there is. I've always said, I believe in spontaneity as long as it's well-planned. Right, and right. So this is just getting me out of my element into that. And well, I knew it was frustrating for Tom because I knew he wanted to try to plan things out and that I couldn't. It was like, that just wasn't going to work. So... Right. Awesome. Lori, you and I work a lot alike, uh, too, where it's like, eh, we'll just take care of it. We'll do it. It's fine. Uh, and I, I understand that from the other planners that I work with, how hard that is. So good for you, Tom, for, for being brave and good for you, Lori, for being willing. Um, now I will say I've experienced my friend Lori sometimes has a little bite to her. Um, if she does not like the way something is going, Tom, have you experienced any of the epic Lori sass yeah i have experienced it but i will say she does it with love so oh, yeah. i don't i don't take it in the wrong way but occasionally i do need to be grabbed by the collar and shaken a little bit and in a in a symbolic sense she'll do that she'll slap some sense into me periodically it is my favorite thing because Lori comes across as so sweet yes right? I, right. I mean, when you meet her and she is you all she is genuinely one of the sweetest people in the world yes and Lori then, is very sweet a, right. <laughs> but then good a, song, good. a string of swear words will come out of her mouth uh -huh. I it's the same with Kendara too like the first time I ever saw Kendara mad I, I bless her because I started laughing because it was such a shock to me. So I always laugh when, when I see the two of you be very human, um, because it reminds me that it's okay that I am human. She, when it comes to that string of, of words, she's an artiste. She is. It's yeah. really it's true. It is. <laughs> it's and, and the F word is my favorite one. Mm -hmm. So, and I try yeah. really hard not to say that on our podcast. I'm not sure it's ever come out. Maybe it did once or twice. Uh, we've never been in Facebook jail. So um, but we, we, I can, I can usually bleep those out or edit it out. I, I shift into my professional brain because when I was working, I was very careful about my language and did not swear. Right. So I can well, Valerie talk. Lewis has been on this podcast. I so you would not be the first person to swear um, on this podcast for sure. We she has taken it to a new level. I love that. <laughs> uh, me too. Me too. So speaking of that professional side of things, uh, you know, Lori, you and I have talked many times about this, about the difference between being in that professional world and then stepping into the metaphysical mm -hmm. professional world, right? And, and um, what an energy shift that is to try to embrace the idea that we can make money for our gifts and that's okay. Um, so with that being said, is there anything that you have learned that you could help with some of the practitioners who are stepping into their gifts right now, as far as like lessons you wish you would have known at the very beginning? Oof. I know that's a tough one. That is a tough one. I've always struggled with, um, well, two things, one charging for doing readings and uh, then also straddling that line between being a professional and working nine to five or whatever and then having this my real life as I always thought of it doing readings and when I retired from that muggle world I felt such freedom to really be who I think I really am and really show my true self which is the spiritual side and and my gifts and my connection to source and to spirit world 
And so I feel like my channeling has really taken off since then in many ways. And I feel much more comfortable being public and also um, charging for it. I think you have to find your own comfort with that. And for me, it's been a process of really working on those parts of me that didn't feel worthy. Like, who am I? I'm not that good. Why would anybody pay for my readings? Mm -hmm. To really coming to that place of, yeah, I have something to offer and I deserve to be paid for it. Right. I think we, I think we all have to struggle through that and through those parts of us that believe that that's not the way it's supposed to be. When I first started, it was supposed to be, you're, it's a gift, so you're supposed to give that to people. And for a while I did because I thought, well, yeah, that's right. It's a gift. Who am I to charge for it? But what I found were these past lives of myself that were deeply steeped in the church and taking those vows of poverty. And once I started to release those, it was like, oh, it really is okay. And my guide kept saying, it's okay to accept this energy exchange is how they see it. Yeah. And so, but it is a struggle. It definitely can be. And, and, you know, one of the things you brought up there was the worthiness aspect mm -hmm. and that ties in so much to giving the messages in the first place, right? Like I, there's so many people who start getting those messages and struggle with who am I to tell somebody this? Do you find that Tom, when you're doing your channeling now in your practice? Well, I'm such a beginner that I'm not, I don't have all the same experiences that you two do, okay. um, but I'm, I'm picking it up. Um, I want to mention something about Lori's skills here. If you're, if you, when do, when should you talk to Lori? And the answer to that question is, well, every day, if you're me, is you have a new question every day, but um, if you're having an, I'd like to speak to your supervisor moment hmm. um, and you want it, the soul council aspect is really it. And so that's what she brings that a lot of people don't bring. And it's so worthwhile and it's so valuable. And it boggles my mind that she might consider that she's not worthy when she can do that skill. So um, this is me, uh, you know, shaking Lori a little bit right now. Yeah. Uh, when you when you're having that moment where you, maybe you've had some information come through, you've had a few readings, and you really want to get to the bottom of what's your life purpose and why are you why are you not getting to where you want to be? Your soul counsel is where you get that answer, and yeah. that's when you go talk to Lori. I love that. Lori, when, when the Soul Council readings first came in for you, what was that like? Well, it's interesting because I think I have always channeled some that those groups a lot of times. I never knew what to call it. I just knew my readings weren't like anybody else's, but I just didn't know what to call it. And then I read Dr. Michael Newton's book, Journey of the Soul. And that's where he starts explaining that his, when he would do regressions with folks, they would explain that they'd gone to the soul world and met with this group of beings that was their counsel, and that's how they planned and reviewed each lifetime before and after. And when I read that, suddenly this light went on. It's like, oh, that's who I've been channeling all this time. So I was able to at least give it a name and define it a little bit and then be able to discern the difference between that group of being stepping through for you and your guides or angels or whoever randomly shows up to speak to you but it took a while i was channeling for a long time before i ever knew that's what they were yeah and i'm just going to give you guys a question and then we're going to move to a different question so you can think about it a little bit but i want to know from each of you and i'm going to answer this as well what bit of information has come from your soul council through Lori that has been the most helpful or epic? Um, so put that in your mind and then that's a teaser for folks. We're going to come back to that in a minute. You guys have to make sure that I actually do. Um, so with the soul council readings that Lori does, one of the things that has been so fascinating to me is to watch Lori, who's been doing this for so long, transition into other types of readings. And so we we would not be doing our best um, for our interstellar friends if we did not bring them up here. Uh, and Lori and I started talking about uh, interstellars or uh, aliens or whatever you want to call it um, many years ago. And when we first started talking about it, Lori, we were pretty hush-hush, right? We were pretty, we don't want to freak anyone out. We don't want to stress people out about it. And 
I would say it is the opposite now with how open we are with talking about this. And the world as a whole is becoming more open with this idea of interstellars and, and what that might mean for us. So as you have transitioned into being more open, what what has uh, what has happened with your interactions with the interstellars? Oh, the good question. Um, I was really resistant. It wasn't that I didn't believe, and I certainly had my own interactions at times, but somehow going public and actually saying, okay, I'm going to channel this being, you know, that's from someplace else, felt just like that one step over the line <laughs> that I wasn't sure I wanted to make. And it took me a while. And, you know, I worked a lot with our friend Douglas Pratt, and he was communicating with them pretty regularly. And he kept saying, you're part of this, you're part of this. And I kept saying, no, 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 I do spirit, you do interstellars, it's all good. And he just kept insisting. And then gradually it became clear as they kept kind of knocking on the door, if you will, <laughs> and talking to me that I could channel them as well. My experience of channeling the interstellars is slightly different. Spirit, I'm definitely conscious when I channel them and we can have a three-way conversation. And with the interstellars, a lot of times, especially in group settings, when a group of them step in to speak, it's like I get pushed aside and I can hear that I'm saying things, but I can't understand. I don't hear really what I'm saying. It's like being in another room, hearing a conversation in the living room when I'm in the, in the back room. And if I'm doing it just one-on-one, -on -one, I'm a little more conscious. So that's been a real shift for me that they really can step in so strongly and in a sense, push my consciousness out of the way a little bit. Yeah, and, and Tom, as you found out more about the interstellar connection that Lori had, how, how did that resonate with you? Was it something that immediately you were like, yep, or was it something that you kind of had to wrap your mind around or do you think we're both crazy? No, I don't think anybody that thinks that is crazy. Um, and uh, I've always felt there's something else out there. So I'm not surprised. But when she mentioned it to me the first time, I was like, oh, really? I mean, really, really, really? And so that was, you know, now that's no big deal. But at right. first it was like, oh, please don't tell me that. And um, then you grow into it. It's no big deal. Um, we are. We would be, as many of us have heard others say, we would be very narrow-minded to think we're the only thing living and breathing in this universe. I know. Look at that image behind you, right? Like, right. Are you kidding? Uh, right. And and that's one of the things that I say a lot in awkwardly Zen is if we don't normalize all of these topics, who is going to, right? If we do not take a stand and say, hey it's okay to have these thoughts. It's okay to interact here. It's okay to do all of these things. Then I don't feel like we really have a right to get upset when people think we're crazy because mm -hmm. we have to, to stand up and say, Hey, this is who we are. And, and it's absolutely acceptable. And we're seeing across the, the board and across awkwardly Zen that when we will take a stand on that, other people feel safer in their situations to ease into it. And I think that that is so, so beautiful. Well, and we even have Awkwardly Zen now also supports a monthly interstellar uh, discussion group. It's an open forum, um, second Monday of the month. And it has just grown and grown and grown. It's fascinating, the people who show up and the discussions that we have. It's amazing to me that there are so many folks out there having these experiences, getting these messages, interacting, and having no place really to share that. And right. so they come to this group and it's Every month, it's just amazing to me who shows up and the stories that they have. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, that's one of the situations that Lori moderates for Awkwardly Zen, um, which moderating, uh, we've had some other moderators on the podcast and moderating, I would say to me is probably the most important job in Awkwardly Zen because I think that creating that safe space mm -hmm. is so key for, for allowing people to feel comfortable to share. Uh, so with that being said, and, and you moderating Awkwardly Zen and Tom, you moderating this podcast, what, what kind of things do you try to make sure that you are doing to create that safe space, either within the podcast, within Awkwardly Zen or out in the world even? Boy, good question. I think that, um, I'd, I ask, I try to ask what I think everybody would like to know. Mm. 
and and just um, the stuff that I always wanted to know. And that's what I try to bring to it as a moderator. And we both moderate. Um, you know, we both do our fair share of that. But um, trying to bring, see, we talk about this stuff uh, like it's no big deal, but some of our viewers are just getting started. Right. So um, we, I try to bring that in to bring their perspective in and still ask those questions that they would like to know. Yeah. Uh, does that answer what you're asking? Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Lori? You know, I think what I mostly try to do is speak as little as possible when I'm acting as a moderator and hold space, send out this energy of inclusivity and holding the space of safety so that everyone else can basically say what they need to say, maybe ask the right question or a question at critical points to keep folks moving along or think about something. But I really try to just hold the space and be still. Yeah. It's sometimes and then, hard. <laughs> it is sometimes hard. Um, it's, I think, way harder for me than it is for you because this girl likes to talk. But uh, as speaking of that, we have just recently started to bring in uh, introvert only Zen Zooms into Awkwardly Zen, which is a um, public chance for our introverted uh, or a little maybe more um, quiet folks to come in and to engage in a softer more subtle, not airy in her big energy. Um, as a matter of fact, I banned myself from them before they even started because I was trying to even coordinate these introvert events and bless the introvert team um, who was like, flinching as I was like, okay, so what are we gonna do? And what's this and okay, and how do I handle that? And what, it, and I thought, you know who I'm gonna ask? I'm going to ask my friend Lori and my friend Tim if they would be willing to step in because they are our softer um, moderators for sure. So uh, how is it holding that space for those folks who might struggle with big energy, which a lot of us have? For me, it feels really natural because I think just naturally I'm introverted. And so I can be still and hold that space. And I'm good with silence. I don't have an issue with it. And we can simply hold and let people process because I think sometimes when you're a little more introverted or quiet, you tend to process a little bit slower and in a different way than extroverts. And we all have our own style. So I'm perfectly comfortable allowing folks that space to do that. Yes. And I love you for that because I do not like silence as we know, like I, I will feel it. It's funny. I do love silence when I'm on my own, but when we are doing an event, I'm like, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. Um, Tom, have you seen this side of Lori? Because if you would ask me if she was an introvert, um, I, I wouldn't say yes to that just because I have seen you in so many beautiful social settings and you handle them in such a extroverted way sometimes that I, I love it. I would say you're quieter than me, <laughs> but have you noticed that Tom, as you're working with Lori, um, just that softness? Yeah. I, the softness is there. The introversion is there, but for you and I, Ari, we know her well enough now that it, it, that we don't see that as often maybe as we did when we first were getting to know. So, um, yeah, Lori will open up and, and she'll, say all, everything that she needs to say. And um, I don't ever worry that she's holding back or being quiet. So, but well, it, it takes a while to get her to open up when you first meet her. And then I won't shut up once you know, but, but the thing is, I think people misunderstand what being introverted and extroverted means. For me, being an introvert means that to recharge my battery after a day being with people, I have to be totally alone, quiet in my own little space and recharge. For extroverts, you have to be generally around people. That's how you recharge is you bringing in all that other energy and it gets you going, gets you pumped. That just drives me crazy. I've been at parties area with you where suddenly I hit this wall and it's like, okay, I have peopled enough and I need to leave now and I leave the party. It wasn't that I wasn't having fun. It was just, I'd reached my tolerance and my introverted self said, okay, we have to go home and just recharge now and be still <laughs> because there's only a certain amount of stimulation I can take. And I think that's the main difference. I'm not, I was shy, I think when I was young, 
but I'm not particularly shy now. And I think, yes, when I'm in a new situation, I tend to be really quiet. But with you two, because I know you, sometimes you can't shut me up. So I try to be cognizant of that, but sometimes I'm not. <laughs> well, and I'm always fascinated because the older I get and the more I go down this path, the more I actually do need to pull back in and recharge, right? Like I'll be like, I am peopled out. You, you want to see me after an event, like leave me alone um, because I need that space. And also watching you step more into that social aspect. It is like, it's fascinating how the universe is like, okay, I'm going to pull you here and I'm going to push you back here. And, and it's like that, the puppet tree of it all. It's interesting. Awkwardly Zen is responsible for me becoming more social. I was never social. I never joined groups. You know, I really valued being pretty still having one or two friends, but mostly being pretty much isolated. And I preferred it that way. And then awkwardly Zen comes along and snapped me out of that. <laughs> so I have become very much more social than I ever was in my entire life. Well, we're, we're grateful for that. What about you, Tom? You a social person or you a got a hide person? Oh, don't make me answer that. Um, He's a musician. What do you think? Uh, yeah. And, and my <laughs> girlfriend the says, too. the music, yeah. She, my girlfriend says I've never met a stranger. So there's that. And she'll come around the corner and I'll be having a full on conversation with someone I just met. Happens a lot. So I, I do that. But Lori's definition of the recharge aspect of it is real for me. And so yeah, there, there's that side where I'm out there shaking hands and kissing babies, but there's also, um, I need my downtime and yeah. I need to reflect and I need to sort of be quiet. Yeah. So it's a double-sided recharge for me. Yeah, I get that for sure. Uh, all right, so we're coming back to our question. So what is the most epic thing that you have heard through Lori from your soul council? Lori, what have you heard from yourself, from your soul council? My soul counselor early on told me that I was going to be what they called a door opener, which was what my person was for me, in that they meant I would be giving these readings and helping people open that door to their spirituality and their understanding and connection to source. And it took me a long time to really understand what that meant and to step into it. Mm, love that, though. What about you, Tom? I think the big message that came through for me was that all this is real and that I'm so analytical that I'm always questioning it even today, but, but there came a moment where I just accepted that all these gifts and my future with them is real. And this is part of my payback for what I, I need to contribute back to the world is helping get all these messages out there. And so I think when I realized that, in meeting with Lori and getting messages about that from my soul group, uh, my soul council, that was really the big deal for me. And since then, the doors have opened and everything is a possibility. Yeah, I would say that's one of my favorite things about Lori when she does the soul council in particular readings is they are door openers, right? Yeah. They are. It is. It's like, Lori, you are walking down and just mm -hmm opening this door up and opening this door up. And then we get to decide if we go through that door, mm -hmm. but a door opener is such a beautiful thing to say about Lori. Yeah, it is. And, and it started with, and I'd like to speak to your supervisor moment, meaning my spirit guides and things weren't unfolding in the right way. And then it turned into that. So uh, it really can be incredibly, um, you know, it, it can inspire and open up everything. Can I just say that when I did my first reading with Tom, he was a blank face and didn't give me any feedback. I thought he hated the reading. And then when he contacted me again a few months later and wanted another reading, I was like, really? I thought you hated the first one. But <laughs> Why are you coming back? <laughs> but Tom, if I remember right, when I read for you, that's kind of what you always did, right? Like you didn't want to give away too much. Um, yeah. which we just love that as readers. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm right there with you, Lori, like that totally brought me flashbacks to reading for Tom too, where I was like, yeah, um, I love that. Are you still like that now, Tom, or are you starting a, a little bit more feedback? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, um, I'm always going to be analytical. It's where I, my brain lives. So 
I'd like to throw myself upon the mercy of the court for forgiveness on on that front from both of you. That's so funny. Um, I will say for me, um, I've had many epic soul council readings with Lori. Obviously, the one that started awkwardly then um, mm -hmm. is will always be my favorite. Um, and in that same reading, one of the things that has kept me going sometimes is, Lori, you said, um, or my soul council said through you, that the book wasn't it, right? Like, keep writing, but the book's not it. But you said, I see you speaking in front of lots and lots of people. And I had seen that vision myself. So to hear you say the same thing that I had seen, I ex experienced, it felt so empowering. Um, and so you're opening doors, you're empowering people. I love that. And, and Tom, to watch you shift into doing these things and trusting yourself more has been really beautiful to watch as well. Thanks. Sure. So with that final thoughts, um, I want to make sure people go and find the podcast. Um, so tell us where they can find the podcast and, um, and kind of, uh, maybe just any last thoughts about what the podcast offers to the world. Hmm. Well, you can find us on YouTube, our spiritual sojourn S O J O U S O J O U R N. And when I first heard the word, I had to look it up. I'm not kidding you. So um, now I've looked it up and now I've memorized the spelling, our spiritual sojourn um, <laughs> on YouTube. And, and that's really, once you get that far, you're going to find us. And our, our objective is education and, and getting people to understand, you know, at least get them started on some of these topics. And we go all over the place. And maybe most importantly, we would love it if people would help guide where we go next. So, yeah. So if you have a question, boy, would we love to hear it. And there's a community page on our YouTube channel where you can add those kinds of questions. Love and that. So, yeah, we would love to know what people would like to hear. Now, you all can also find the podcast um, on our page because we have a playlist with all of the spiritual sojourn, our spiritual sojourns. So you can find that there. Now, Lori, what would you love everyone to walk away with about the podcast and about um, what they might get from it? I think pretty much what Tom said, it's a way of opening that door, helping you find others that can answer questions for you or give you information you may be seeking out or help you find ways of finding those people um, as we go along. Uh, I think Spirit's whole point was to get out this message that it's real, they're here with us, they want to help us, they're here to guide us, help us on our path, help us with our awakening. And that was their whole point is listen to your guides, here's how you connect with us. And for me, that's the message as well, is pay attention to that guidance that we already have. Pay attention. That was the name of the skit I put out this morning. Uh, so there you go, a little synchronicity for us today. Well, I want to thank both of you for being here with me today and with our listeners. Uh, and again, everybody, you can find Lori on the Awkwardly Zen partner page um, mm -hmm. if you're looking to book with her. Tom, I don't think you're quite doing readings publicly yet. Uh, but you can find both of these amazing people um, on our spiritual sojourn uh, on YouTube. And again, we have a playlist on our own page here on Awkwardly Zen Network that you guys can check that out. So go there. You can also find the podcast on our webpage, awkwardlyzen.com. So lots of options to find them there. Um, you guys go give them a follow, like love each other here. And the more we can kick all of us up in the, the algorithm, the more we can share what we need everyone to know, and we can come together as light workers here in this beautiful time period that we're in. Um, and I want to believe that that's where we are. So thank you all for being here and uh, we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.